So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Melbourne Entrepreneurial Centre's third fireside chat of the year. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country from where I'm speaking to you from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today. So I'll just mention a bit of housekeeping before we go any further. So I'd like to politely ask that everybody keeps their microphones on mute until we get to the audience Q&A towards the end. And also please do be aware that this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our Met YouTube page later. Thank you. So to quickly introduce myself, my name is Abby. I'm the events coordinator for the Melbourne Entrepreneurial Centre, the home of entrepreneurship at the University of Melbourne. I'll be your host for today's session and on behalf of the wider team, including my colleagues at uh, Matt and Tram, thank you very much for coming along. So um, to start the session today, I will ask Daisy some questions for about 20 to 25 minutes, um, and then we'll get to into her background, learn more about the MAP program, and then at the end, we'll open up the floor for questions uh, from you guys. So you can, uh, that'll take us through to the end of the session at 1.15 today. So it's quite short and sweet, and we've got, got a lot to pack in. Um, so while we're going along, if you do have any questions that spring to mind um, that you'd like to ask Daisy, just pop them in the chat and then we will get to them in order. Uh, so just oh. so this is the third of our Meet the Managers Focus Fireside Chats for the year. So these are designed as an opportunity um, for us all to get to know the amazing people who run the programmes within the Melbourne Entrepreneurial Centre and uh, deep dive into their backgrounds and experience within the startup space. So um, I'd like to now welcome Daisy Marn, our new Melbourne Accelerator Programme Manager, who has been with us since July. Um, it's been, um, like I said, it's been um, a short session today, so we're going to jump straight into it. And I'll ask Daisy, um, how did you first get drawn to Startup Life? Oh, hang on, let me think. So I was, when I was about 19, by the way, it's great to be here and thanks, thanks so much for, for tuning in everyone. I can see some familiar faces and some folks from the MAP community as well, so that's fantastic and I'm like glad to be here. So how did I get drawn to the startup space? I, when I was 19, I actually did this placement in Thailand as a volunteer placement helping refugees and asylum seekers. And at this stage, I was studying an arts law degree. No one in my family runs a business. I didn't know any entrepreneurs. I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. And like a lot of folks, I think in the art space, it's not something that you think about, like business or starting a business at least. Um, and I, at that time, thought I wanted to be a human rights lawyer. And I was as far from an entrepreneur as you could think. I was uh, like a very left-leaning, tree-hugging, hippie type of person. And I thought business is everything that's wrong with the world, particularly after the global financial crisis and uh, consumerism and all these things. And I was very observant about them. Um, but when I was in Bangkok and I was doing this placement, um, there was a program there, although our job was just to provide legal aid and I was just a junior doing the research, there was a program there that supported um, with Sri Lankan Tamil women to build small micro enterprises and they asked if someone wanted to help out with that program and I looked around and I thought okay no one's really put their hand up so I put my hand up and I knew nothing about it but I thought hey I can give it a crack and they said they wanted us to change the curriculum to adapt it for the environment in Thailand because it was currently being used in I think Kenya and I again I knew nothing about adapting a curriculum I was 19 but I was like, okay, wherever it says Thailand, I'll write, where it says East Africa, I'll write Thailand. Where it says Swahili, I'll write Thai. Where it says urban, I'll write rural. And I gave it to my boss, like I've done my best. And then, you know, we went on to implement that program. And I got to see the impact firsthand that it had on these women. Because in, in Thailand, these women had no work rights. They couldn't actually get a job. They had no right to be there. So really invisible. And they were struggling financially. Some of them had been there for four to five years. And then when they were able to let, learn some micro entrepreneurial skills and we as expats were able to link them to a market who could buy some of the things they made, it really lifted their sense of agency because they, they didn't just want a handout. The, the fact that they were able to make or create something that other people wanted to buy and other people found useful made, made them feel like they belonged, made them feel like they were, you know, when they're feeling so worthless, made them feel like they were worth something. And I think watching that from afar, I finally understood oh, entrepreneurship is not just about big business and corporate greed and these things. It's actually a way to empower people to bring ideas to life and ideas 
that help their customers and ideas that help them become really, you know, quite um, resourceful and self-sufficient. Yeah. Wow, that that's incredible. That's such an yeah, such an interesting way that you kind of discovered entrepreneurialism and wanting to get into the space. So yeah, that's that's a great story. Um, I guess my next question would be, could you actually talk us through your career and kind of your pathway into the current role at Map? And just on that as well, I did read that you've had you had seventeen jobs by the age of twenty five. Um, and can you also just tell us what the backstory is there? <laughs> oh, look, I've had seventeen jobs and something like I think it was about 20 or I forget the exact around 20 or 18 volunteer jobs that are separate to the paid jobs so I've had quite a few um paid work I've done all sorts of things like I think I, I started at 14 um I think I was meant to be 14 and nine months but I was like one month younger but I convinced them to hire me because I just wanted to be I was fiercely independent or I wanted to be fiercely independent um and I think it was at Wendy's an ice cream shop <laughs> so I started there and then I worked at a news agency and then I worked for waitress and I did custom service. I did telemarketing, which got, which is why now when I have to make outbound phone calls or call people, I don't even hesitate. I think I used to make 300 calls a day when I did that for about six months. Um, done all sorts of jobs. I also worked, I learned a lot working for a small business owner and working for her. I learned she was the type of business owner that did every aspect of her business and I was her first hire. So she went on holidays to Bali for a month and I ran her whole business for her. And at the end of that, I think I was like, wow, I've learned a lot too. I don't think I'm paid now. <laughs> um, but it was really, that was a very eye-opening experience. So all sorts of different jobs. And then I joined Deakin University to do what I'm kind of doing here. But I was originally a, um, a student entrepreneurship consultant. I remember I had a role as a casual for about three weeks in the and I was like, what's what's my title? I don't know. Like, I, you've just kind of got me supporting entrepreneurial programs. It wasn't a job that was um, advertised formally, per se. I just started volunteering and they created a role and said, look, we probably need someone to do this casual work. And slowly after that, um, entrepreneurship programs were really new. Like, they're only about eight to top 10 years old in Australia, I think. Map it being one of the oldest. And this was like the first or second year of the program at Deakin. And so I did that. And within two years, um, I became the manager. And then I, I was there for a total of six years managing entrepreneurial programs. But again, I didn't finish my degree until maybe four years into being a manager. Like I was always studying alongside this. I was studying part time um, because for me, it was always really it was really important to like learn different things through experience rather than just theoretical. Because I knew I didn't for me, I didn't necessarily want to be an academic. That's the paid work. The volunteer work, if I have to be really honest, is where I learned most of my, what I consider really important skills. Because I would join an organization like um, one of the earlier ones, the United Nations Youth Association. And I learned facilitation skills. And then by the time I was 18, someone there really encouraged me. I wasn't very confident, but pushed me to join their board. And it's like, a, it's a volunteer youth-led organization. So everyone's under 25. So it's a little bit intimidating when you're 18, but not super intimidating. Um, and as part of being on the board, I was a HR director. So I managed our 100 to 150 volunteers. I sort of designed trainings for them. I coordinated which schools they would be at. And um, I felt like someone had given me an opportunity to really step up. So I think I felt like I had big shoes to fill. So I was always maybe doing a lot more um, than that was required. Because I thought, wow, they kind of placed faith in me to manage all these volunteers. I should really, really see through that I do it well. Uh, that was a big one. I also volunteered to be part of community banks and I was on their board. Um, most people don't realize this, but community banks are actually um, the directors are predominantly volunteer. This is there's Bendigo Bank, there's Bendigo Community Banks. They're franchisees with a network of about 2,000 volunteer directors across Australia, and 80% of the profits go back to the community. That's why they volunteer. Uh, the bank, particular community bank I joined as a volunteer director was um was one of the most profitable in the entire country. So they did give like a small fee to reimburse you because it was a lot of meetings we have to have. But that's where I learned governance skills on the governance committee. I chaired a youth advisory committee. And um, again, being on the board is probably where I learned a lot of the board skills. I learned a lot about power dynamics, how decisions are made, how people influence other people. I was, everyone on the board was probably 50 to 60, average age was 50 to 60. And I was uh, 21 when I joined as a director. So I learned a lot there about, I guess the boards are often, you know, at that governance level. So I learned a lot about that. But I did decide after five years, I really prefer the startup environment. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so just, just a few things that you've done then. <laughs> yeah. I get, I, get bored, I get bored easily. 
Uh, I mean, but like you said, you know, all, all of the different things that you've done, um, they've all helped you in some way, like gain a different skill set. So, um, yeah, that's that's incredibly impressive. Yeah, 100 percent. I feel like people are often trying to discover their passion or what they want to do. For me, it was a process of elimination. I said yes to a lot of things. And I said, hey, I'll stick this out for three months or if I really hate it, I'll leave soon. But a lot of jobs I stuck out for three to six months or volunteer roles. And I was like, ah, uh, now this one's not quite for me. Or I thought this was my dream job. Not quite for me. So I think I went through that process of elimination, which which was helpful rather than we have so many options now and we often get confused trying to pick one that we don't make a decision. So I think I just said yes to everything until I worked out what wasn't boring. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's great. And I guess it's it's really interesting how how life works, isn't it? And how how you end all those experiences have now led you to where you are. So um mm -hmm. yeah, you're definitely a bit of an all-rounder, <laughs> I'd say. So yeah um so on that as well um so as well as all the experience that you've had um volunteering and jobs wise you're also a startup founder several times over can you talk us through what your most recent venture is which is the australian south asian center like how did you come up with the concept um and what really excited you about the idea interesting i'll say just say i'm not sure if a lot of the things i've started started up are startups because there haven't really been technology centric fast growth um, and it, it's, you know, the definitions of startups vary, but a lot of them are technology centric fast growth. I have started a lot of different things and Australian South Asian Centre is a um, not for profit organisation I started a couple of years ago. And this is, it was after I went on a trip to London and I was so inspired being immersed in an environment of other um, South Asian women who were creatives, brown women doing really interesting work across different spaces. And I just thought we have nothing like this in Australia to this degree, to this level. And at that time, I wanted to move to London. And then lockdown happened. So I came, I came back home and I thought, well, look, second best to joining an existing community like that is why don't I try to foster an environment in Australia for South Asian women and allies that's like that. So South Asian women is from India, from Pakistan, um, from Sri Lanka, it's kind of that region. And because we have very, very little representation here. Uh, so we help, we help, we're a community of creatives, of founders and, and professionals that come together. We have like a membership based model. Uh, we do regular member meetings. We also, we also organize stuff in the arts, like during Melbourne Comedy Festival, we organize Brown Women Comedy, where we, through all our work, we're looking at amplifying the voices of these founders and creatives and their work. Um, and we've also done a little bit of stuff in the domestic violence space, just as a response to what the community was asking for at that time during COVID. And that work was um, that work was profiled by SBS World News and whatnot. So that that was quite um, that's probably something I've been really proud of that that I got to do that. And I, I hope through the organisation we get to do more of that in the future. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I started it by being inspired by another location and thinking how do we accelerate the pace of change when it comes to diversity and inclusion in Australia. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Um, so did you kind of start that, you said, during the pandemic? So were you doing a lot of this remotely? Yeah, it was, I'm trying to think, yeah, it was all online at the beginning. A lot of it was remote, except for when we started doing the domestic violence sort of work slash well, I like to call it well-being. It got labelled domestic violence, and I think I'm using the terminology now, but we tried to focus on well-being and take a more holistic approach. It has a lot of stigma as well. That was a lot was in person because during COVID, we leased a large property and we provided um, like a well-being space for women in need. Um, it wasn't a shelter per se. People were actually labeled a shelter because something like that actually doesn't exist. And the idea was to really remove the stigma. So although probably 90 to 80% of people who stayed there were experiencing some sort of domestic violence, from the outset, we made it clear that it's just a well-being space. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was in person. And during COVID, that was allowed because it was, you know, um, yeah, dealing with issues, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's that's such a worthy cause. I mean, it's yeah, great, great work, definitely. Um, so following on from that, you were recently recognized for your positive contribution to the future of Asia at the Ma Melbourne Asia Game Changer Awards in 2021. I think I've got that right. Um, so could you tell us more about what the Australian Digital Job Accelerator is for what which this honor was associated with? Yeah. Um, that was yeah, that was a fun award. I think that was getting your name. Uh, was it Melissa Leong from MasterChef? Was there? I was, <laughs> I was, sorry, I was a bit starstruck. I think um, uh, she was interviewing us, and it was, it was a fantastic session. I thought um, that I just something I started again a couple of years ago. Pandemic baby. I was looking for a 
freelancer for this. I have a I have a comedy podcast. I'm looking for a freelancer to edit it. Um, and it's it's in Punjabi, which is a language in India, so it's not in English. So I needed a very specific freelancer in India who could speak Punjabi or here who could speak Punjabi. And ideally, I wanted to hire a female just because I thought I first actually the way I noticed that is all the people who pitched for the job were 95 percent men. And I was like, well, where are the women at? Like, this is like work from home, really suitable work for, you know, women who might have family or might be at home for now, I guess during COVID, everyone was at home. And I was just looking through, looking through, and I thought podcasts are like a booming now. It's like kind of like blogs and like people have podcasts almost as frequently as they have blogs. And I was like, so podcast editors, podcast producers, this is a very like in-demand job for someone who can do it well. But there was, there was like no women at all. And I started getting like obsessed with this kind of problem, which is, how many female freelancers of the whole portion of people get freelance work? How many are women? And we couldn't exactly find that data. We reached out directly to Upwork and freelancer.com, but we we had we did our own assessment. Like we looked at different things. And from memory, I think it was less than 20% or even less than that, uh, are women pitching for jobs and getting them for freelance sites. And so the Australian Digital Job Accelerator was something we started to tackle this. Um, originally, it was really focused on India because, again, I've always been passionate about like economic empowerment of women in need. But we ended up doing 50% women in India and 50% women uh, in Australia. We did have some from Singapore and the US as well. And the program was just, a, it's an education. Um, it's a course really, and it was teaching you how to get clients as a freelancer and how to become one. We didn't teach the skill per se, something we taught you to explore the different, like we teach to explore the different opportunities in freelancing. But the main thing was teaching you how to sell yourself, how to land your first client, how to respond to a pitch so you land it. And then how to deal with, um, after you've done the delivery of that project, how do you kind of deal with um, customer service after that? And, and again, the aim was just to, to help women be economically empowered and to kind of earn an income and to have the, the freedom that comes with that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it sounds like um, it was definitely a well-deserved award then. Um, yeah, again, it was really, really great work and um, definitely awesome that you're supporting um, women. Yeah, love that. Um, so I guess gaining first-hand experience as a founder must have helped you in your current role as MAP program manager. What would you say some of the important learnings are that you've used to help other founders? I, one of the things, I think I understand how hard it is. It's, it's very hard to start a startup and I don't want to scare you off. Like a lot of things are hard. If I had to pick like a boring, monotonous job versus a hard, hard startup that was, you know, very difficult to I'd pick that any day because at least it's interesting <laughs> so I think I really empathize with the difficulty of, of of what they're going through I think being a startup kind of the hardest thing you have at the beginning is getting customers if you don't have customers you don't have money and all you have is an idea right and it doesn't go far so you've got to get customers early on and or at least talk to them early on so I with my kind of Kind of organizations and businesses I started, a lot of it was outreach, finding customers, cold calling, emailing, using LinkedIn. So I can really empathize working with people who might have brilliant ideas but need to talk to customers and need to get on the phone. And that that hustle to go reach out to find people, it's not it's not comfortable for everyone, especially if you're a bit more introverted. But if you're a solo founder, you you can't really outsource it to someone. You have to do it. Or if there's two of you that are both in the tech space or researchers, you really you don't have the money to to fund someone else to do it. You will have to find you you have to cultivate the skills to do it. And I think that's something I definitely cultivated during my time doing the different things I've done. Mm -hmm. So I think that those two are the ones that I think have been most helpful, as well as just broadening your network. Part mm -hmm. of the organizations that I've started and the different projects, I've really, really broadened my network of different people. And it's been great to tap on their shoulders if we need to, you know, introduce founders here to someone or if they're like, well, does anyone know anyone in this field? I'm like, yep, probably do. Let me introduce you. Um, so broadening your network when you're starting something, I think that's another thing that's been helpful. Mm, yeah, I think I think those are some uh, great bits of advice. Um, so while we're actually on the startup space, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about um, specifically MAP? Uh, what's the value of the program, would you say? And kind of just tell everyone what, what the program involves. Oh, well, MAP's one of the oldest programs in Australia and it's got a fantastic reputation. I remember attending MAP events before I even started my role in this space at another university. Um, and MAP's really built like a strong reputation in supporting founders. 
And it's one of the most valuable things about math. Sure, you get $20,000. We normally fund 10 to 11 teams a year, and you get $20,000 equity free funding, which is essentially a grant. Um, and you have to meet some milestones and come up with a plan. And you get access to the brilliant Melbourne Entrepreneurship Centre, this space here. And it's not just about space, it's, it's, it's this cohort effect that you're going through this journey with like 10 other startups, and they're here and you're here. And it really helps with focus and accountability. Two things you really struggle with at the beginning when you don't know what to do, you don't feel like tackling the problem today because you've had so much rejection, but you get up and you show up because other people are there. So I think that focus and accountability is really, really good. And then the third main thing is I think the network. The MAP network is phenomenal. The generosity in the startup space is exceptional to begin with, but with MAP, you've got alumni, you've got investors who are reaching out to you to help you. And I think that generosity in that network is really helpful especially when being a founder is quite um quite a lonely journey like if you're going at it alone working at it like your laptop at home you get a bit bored you also feel really like lonely in that that journey so here you've got not only the cohort but you've got mentors and people and here there's a dedicated entrepreneurial residence for each team that meets you every week to catch up with you and then we also separately have a meeting with all the entrepreneurial residents coming together where we will talk about um, how to help some of the companies as well. So there's a whole, um, it's like a, you know, it's it's a, an environment where there's lots of support poured in for you. And again, it's not that MAP will make your startup succeed. It's that it gives you all the, it gives you the environment and the ingredients to really accelerate. You might come in with an idea and midway through be like, oh, this idea is really not working. You pivot into a new one. And that doesn't work and you pivot into something new. But the aim is to really learn and to accelerate rather than spending two years slowly building something to really accelerate the pace of that growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great description. I think that really um, highlights kind of the value of, of what the program is and, and how it can help. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's other really like I think there's a lot of ambitious people doing this program, and I feel like ambition and passion are contagious. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're around people like that, it really uplifts your spirit, and you 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 know it helps you with your um like resilience and grit. Yeah, I I hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my next question, I guess it's going to link back to kind of what you said about um, some of your experiences abroad, um, and you definitely have experienced a lot of different cultures um, across the world, having spent time, I think, studying in Spain, um, you said working on social impact projects in Tanzania, and as you mentioned, um, you know, assisting in legal aid for refugees in Thailand. So um, what I think is interesting is when we talk about entrepreneurialism, we tend to focus kind of on the Western societies, you might say. So Australia, the UK, Silicon Valley, and so on. How have your experiences abroad kind of shaped your understanding of what it means to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, well, you've really done your research. <laughs> um, I think, again, in a different market, some, it can be very, very different. Like you can have something here that works and then you go launch it in another country and you're like, it's not working, why isn't it working? And you realise that people have a different perspective, the way that they approach things is different, the terminology you're using, not just the language, but the way you're using to describe your product doesn't resonate, doesn't make sense. So I think like if you're entering a different market, you really have to understand the culture. It's not just, oh, they have this problem, let us fix this problem. It's understanding um, the culture and what different issues they have and also the, the financial like I think Australia America UK are countries where people have very high disposable incomes so people you can find customers that are willing to pay a significant amount for a particular product and not that this isn't always the case in other countries but you have to be depending on what you're pitching what product you have if it's not SaaS for b2b then if it is b2c then your price point has to be a lot lower like if you look at Netflix India versus Netflix here very different uh, uh, Amazon books in like India versus here, Audio, Audible, I think is very, very different pricing. Again, that pricing also reflects that in other countries, there might be, if it's a bigger one, is a billion people there versus 20 million in Australia. So you can get a lot, a lot more customers. So I think that's, that's the main thing. It's, it's a, a, you know, a, folk, a difference in language, um, not just like English versus Hindi or English versus, you know, something else. It's the way that someone talks about a particular problem. It's a, the, also, the ba based on how much money they have to spend on that particular product and what is um, what's the bench benchmark that's already exists, mm -hmm. I think it's easier to test things where you are familiar with an environment. 
So when you're not familiar with the environment and you go there, um, for example, a while ago, I tried to, I went to Punjab and I stayed there for a few months. I was hoping to live there um, at, for a period of time. And at the time, I was trying to understand this initiative I called Bold Punjab to Empower Women. I was trying to understand, like, how do we get more women into tech startups? And that, again, I was quite naive because I've been working in Estella already. I was like, we could do this there. And then I got there and I realized, wow, there, there's so much to be done before you even get to this stage that I took for granted. So sure, Bangalore is a bit of a hub in India. Mumbai is a hub, but not up north, not Punjab. There's still like 20, 25 million people roughly there so it's the size of Australia it's one state but I went around to one of the major cities talked to so many different women and I just realized it was you know the industry there was very very different and before you could even get to launching tech startups you needed to have some basic skills which were not being taught mm -hmm. um, in schools a lot of the schools were training them to take on traditional jobs like teaching nursing engineering medicine right mm -hmm. and I realized oh I've come here with the idea that we can start an accelerator and um, you know, have tech startups come out of the other side. And that part of that learning was also what fed into the digital job accelerator, as well as realizing that people needed freelancing opportunities. I realized, okay, let's maybe provide opportunities to people to work through the freelancing environment. Um, again, that was based on the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, um, yeah, I guess that kind of those those um, observations are really interesting from you because especially because you've actually spent time in those communities and yeah it really highlights the importance of the of the work that you're doing with um, some of your own startups there so yeah yeah that's really great to hear um I'm going to pivot to a different area now for my next question um you've got a really large following on LinkedIn and Instagram along with your own website so um I've always wondered kind of how how did you actually um you know grow your following and are there any strategies you could share with the people on the on the oh. call um, you know the ways that you actually empowered um people you know through using your your platforms sure i talk mainly about linkedin my instagram's really switched a lot to comedy i have a whole another kind of bigger side of you where i just like having fun online through tiktok and instagram and <laughs> switched a lot to comedy but you know at times when we are um opening up the course then we do then i do do content around that specifically um I think with LinkedIn, one, I did get on there early. I've got to be honest, I got on there early. Uh, but also, I was a bit ruthless with content. I would make content. If I had a particular thought, I wouldn't. The hardest way to make content, the most difficult way is you sit down in front of LinkedIn and you think, oh, what do I type today? No, I draw a blank. Everyone will draw a blank. But I think when you're going along the day and you have an observation about something or you're at work and you learn something, just pop down in your notes because that is what makes the best posts, I think. Um, people talk about batching content and everything. I still haven't got, gotten very good at that because to sit there and have an hour of creativity is hard for me. My observations come throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, LinkedIn also, one thing I should start with is a lot of people still think LinkedIn is like a resume and you're on there to get a job. I have not been looking for a job for at least seven years. I've had one and I've still been relatively active on LinkedIn. I took a break for about six months recently, but I've been quite active on there because for me, it was never about getting a job. For me, it was just about sharing and growing in an environment of other people. And I've always been excited about what other people do for their work. We spend, I wrote about this recently, but we spend one third of our lives sleeping, one third personal, family, volunteer, community, friends, one third at work. So if you take out sleeping, half your life is spent at work. Mm -hmm. I don't, so we spend a lot of time on social media talking about personal lives or, you know, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about our professional lives. And I think that's why for me, it's, Quite, been quite important to somewhat be active on there to learn about what other people are doing the following is built over time by doing sort of regular posts um posts about observation things i've observed things i've learned um as well as i try to amplify the work of other people recently we started awards so i share uh, other people that we recognize i think that's really important in terms of creating content I'm trying to think, aside from being regular content i'm really like I, I'm quite a normal, but I say normal, what's the word? Um, I'm not necessarily, I, I struggle with the word professional. I don't love the word professional because I think it implies formal. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have someone who behaves in a formal way, they're not as approachable. You see them more, a bit more robotic, a bit more, um, it's hard to build a relationship and to bond with someone when they're behaving in a very formal way or they're speaking in a very formal language, written. So now coming back to LinkedIn, because it's mostly written, if you write and you write in a formal way on LinkedIn, I don't think you'll get far because people are looking for something that's easy to read, 
easy to connect with. So one of my rules of thumbs of any uh, rule of thumb of any contact um, of any content, sorry, that you write is to say it out aloud. If you wouldn't talk like that, don't publish it. Don't write like that. Obviously, it takes time. It seems really easy, but to to date, I will be about to write something and I'll write it up and I'll be about to post it. And then I read it out aloud and I'd say, I don't talk like this. Why am I posting this? Because people are going to read it. So keep that rule of thumb really, really helps. And it helps you write stuff that's more interesting, engaging, simple, readable. Um, so I think that's a really important thing in terms of doing content. It is hard. It's something you, throughout our university life, if you went to, you know, if you go to university, you learn how to write in a way that no one speaks in. So if you spend five or three years doing that, then it's re- you need to spend, it might take three to five years for you to unlearn that in the context of writing copy. You can still use that language for writing academic papers or in the case that you need to be formal. The majority of your communication in life will be like email, Slack, social media content. It'll be in a more human, less formal way. So I think that's also served me well on LinkedIn to just put aside this, oh, what will people think if I'm not professional on here? And be like, well, who am I? How do I deliver that through LinkedIn in a way that's authentic to me? And I, I try to keep things simple. Yeah. Oh, that, that's great. Um, those are some really good tips and they've, they've obviously worked for you. So yeah. Um, and I'll share with everybody on the call, um, all the links to, to Daisy's um, social media. So you can, you can follow her. She's really, really great to follow. So yeah. <laughs> um, last, last question before I move over to the audience Q and a, um, I'm really intrigued about your trips to the Himalayas each year. You said that you go there to meditate for a month. Could you tell us like what prompted you to start doing this and what does it actually involve when you're there? Um, I first went when I was 19. And again, I kind of, my family, and like, I don't know anyone who goes there. I knew of a distant um, relative that went that, that knows some people that go there, but she'd never been there herself, which I didn't realize until I got there. So I, what prompted it? I think at 19, I was going through a bit of a tough, tough time, like mental health wise. And I was struggling and I was exploring different, different avenues to get better. I think I was seeing a therapist at that. I mean, it's, it's helpful to see a therapist, but that time it wasn't, I think I needed more. I think I needed an, um, like an intensive intervention more than what a, a therapist could provide at the time. And I needed to, I think, just get away from the kind of hustling back in life here. So someone mentioned an ashram to me and I knew nothing about it. I wasn't particularly religious at the time. And I thought, oh, it's a religious place, probably not for me. And then I realized, no, there's lots of people that go to ashrams just to be silent, to soak in nature, to meditate. So that's what prompted me. I, I thought, you know what, I've tried all these things. They're not working. Let me try something new. And that's how I ended up there, this kind of this place. And I went there for three days was my plan. And then I stayed for four and five and six and seven. And then somehow I remember around Christmas time, I, I kind of, you have, to, you have to hitchhike down from this place, very remote, hitchhike to the main town um, in Rishikesh, actually. And I extended my, my, my plane trip back and I ended up staying a total of like 45 days. And I've gone back every, almost every year, religiously, ironically, um, for, for about eight years. I think I've missed three maybe one we went to South America instead one I moved to Tanzania to help so every year where I haven't got another commitment in terms of going abroad elsewhere I, I still go there to meditate oh wow that, yeah, I think it keeps me sane some people have a really good um daily routine where you wake up and you do 10 minutes of meditation I wish I was that person I'm not that person I think if you zoom out with my, I zoom out with my life on a macro sense I have some balance like, oh, I meditated for a month intensively, six to eight hours a day, you know, not in one sitting, but one hour here, one hour there. Um, but I don't have that when I zoom out. Like, I can get quite carried away with work and just keep doing it. So I find that if I just get to December and I stop, pull the plug, stop everything, turn off my phone, turn off everything, then that provides me um, a lot of peace and, and calm. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I bet you come back feeling like completely refreshed and just amazing and like ready for the year ahead. So yeah, yeah it puts things into perspective as well. So I think we often think everything's a bit, bit more important than it needs to be and important to a point where it affects your health or your mental health or you're spending all your time at work. I mean, I like I'm a big advocate of work being important, but I, I, I think you've um, also got to take care of your well-being. So I think being there, I come back and I think, you know, what? I was really happy up there and I wasn't doing anything and I wasn't talking to anyone. I was just sitting there. And I was very content. So it's a reminder that even without anything, that you can still be very content and that a lot of our problems are created, especially in, you know, first world countries like Australia, like we get really stressed about things and we take a step back and we think, oh, 
that's something I've created for myself right now. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, time is getting away from us. I'm going to open up the um, the floor to the audience. If you've if you've got any questions, um, you can either use the raised hand function or you can just pop it in the chat if you like, and I can read it out for you. Um, so just while we're waiting for any questions to come in, I guess Daisy, I'll ask you. Um, just think of another one for you quickly. Um, I wanted to know about your podcast and your love of podcasting. So what is the Daisy Project about? Uh, that's when I started a little while ago. Um, and the idea was just to interview inspiring people. I love having conversations. I feel like like just even this, I love talking to people. I love mainly sitting in your seat, Abby, and asking other people lots of questions and sharing stories. I feel like you can learn a lot that way. But also I just I just enjoy it. <laughs> You're quite extroverted. So I thought, why don't I um, interview people that I or just have an informal conversation with people who are inspiring? And that's where that sort of started. Um, I've only done a handful of episodes there and then I again got caught up with life. And then I have another one, which is a comedy one, which uh, I explain the meaning of Punjabi music lyrics. Mm -hmm. And again, Punjabi is a language spoken by over 200 million people in the world, um, 120 odd million in Pakistan, I think, 30 in India and the rest scattered along, along the rest of the world. And I think it's the third most spoken language in the United Kingdom now. Don't quote me, but up in the top five, same with Canada. Australia is heading in that direction as well. So it is a very common spoken language. So a lot of people don't know about it. That's why I said, that's why I just thought I'd, I'd provide that. So it, it was just a funny comment. My sister normally tells me the meaning of Punjabi songs and I don't know what they all mean because my language skills are pretty fluent but music's always a hard thing to understand. So I started a podcast just translating just a conversation. It's, it's quite, it's very comic. And my sister's a character and a half. She's she still has a spotlight there. And um, yeah, I just ask her the meaning of songs in a very comic way, and then we explain them. And they're free, they're songs that people have been listening to for ten, like quite a long time. We do new songs, mainly old songs. And like at every wedding they play, at every Indian wedding, and it's amazing. We dance to these songs, but we don't know what they mean. <laughs> we just like the beat, so we kind of explain the meaning. And my love of podcasting is just, I guess, comes from my love of I guess having conversations, having a laugh, having some banter. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, we'll have to have to give that one a listen. Definitely. I've um, got a question from uh, Stephanie on uh, if you want to just unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Great. Thanks. Um, hi, Daisy. Just a bit of context. So I'm um, an associate director of Stratcom. So I'm in the University Function in Strategic Communications and was involved in the recent launch of the commercialization funds. Yeah. And prior to that was at Australia Post, but managed the partnership between MAP and I guess I was aware of that yeah yeah so so kind of have a bit of a history with MAP I'm interested in your thoughts on the future of university accelerators broadly just in general but also around MAP specifically it's been 10 years since it was started what yeah. are you thinking about changing or doing differently in your role that's really interesting I'll, I'll start with the first first one because I've only been here a short period of time uh, with MAP specifically so the future of incubators Look, I think if you if you look, I was looking at looking at America and uh, American universities, and almost all of them have incubator accelerator programs. And they've had them for about twenty plus years. So Australia is a little bit late to the game. I think over time, some of this what you learn in incubators and accelerators will be integrated into curriculum, but it's it's very difficult. It's not easy because a lot of what incubators accelerators do and what MAP does is about network. How do you integrate network into a curriculum? You really can't unless your lecturer specifically has that experience or knowledge or has those connections to bring guest lecturers in. And even then, often a guest lecturer will pop in and then leave, right? Um, in America, a lot of the lecturers are really well connected and, and they'll put you in touch with people. I don't think we have that much of a culture in Australia yet, at least. So I think accelerators are here to stay because they provide that. And it's one, it's a huge, um, it's a valuable asset when it comes to building a business is that network um so I think yeah incubators and accelerators are definitely here to stay I think there'll be more integration into curriculum of some of the things so some of the things we do workshops on here like product market fit like finding your first customer all of that like raising um, venture capital money that can be integrated into into curriculum and again as long as it's um, integrated in a way that you get people from, I hate the word industry, but that's what university uses, industry. We use startup ecosystem. Uh, as long as you get people who have done that stuff in business, not just theoretically, coming in and um, contributing alongside the academics, I think you get better outcomes. So I think that's that in terms of 
the future of accelerators, incubators, and just entrepreneurship more broadly. We have to be careful. I've seen some universities deliver very, very theoretical entrepreneurial education. And I guess that might be okay if you want to be in, um, what's a word? If you're in a corporate and you're doing innovation, it's a word for it. Intrapreneur, that's it. Sometimes that can be yeah. useful. Yeah, it can be useful for a very, very, like, I, I don't think a lot of that comes, I don't think a lot of that ends up useful if you really want to start a business. Because I think, again, the cohort set, the network, the funding, these are the ingredients that get you there. Might help with the knowledge side of things a bit. Um, in terms of the future of Matt, what I'd like to bring, huh, that's an, uh, I, don't know, I think hmm, Matt has, like, I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here because there's a, a great history of where Matt's been. I think MAP has also been quite a, from afar, if I have to observe, quite an exclusive community, quite a prestigious, exclusive community. And there is merit to that. But I think that also leaves certain people out who don't think they belong. And because from afar, it's so high, it seems so at least highly competitive. Some people just filter themselves out without even giving it a crack. So I think a lot of this stuff is actually really helpful, like these sessions, getting to meet people, having a more down-to-earth approach, because I don't think you want to leave people out, or at least, they, like, you want to give them a shot, and I think that's one thing with MAP, is making sure there's that regular engagement, and I think Abby and Sarah and the MEC team are doing this a lot, is making sure there's that regular engagement. I think more broadly, the MAP and the MEC, the Melbourne Entrepreneurship Centre, are looking to, again, a more integrated approach. Um, there's a lot more initiatives from the university that are popping up, Stephanie, like I guess you're, you're involved in them. So like the Genesis Fund, which has just popped up, well, especially for Melbourne, University of Melbourne. So if you have an affiliation to Mel University of Melbourne. And again, if you're not a student, staff, or alumni, you can get that affiliation by being involved. I understand in TRAM or Runway, which are the other two programs before MAP or uh, TRAM is more for researchers. Um, and so you can get involved in those to, I guess, have some affiliation with the university and then be eligible for these other funds. So Genesis, I was just reading about that today. Um, it's a fund in collaboration with Breakthrough Victoria. And uh, I think there's quite a, a lot of money up but per company. I think it's about somewhere between $200,000, $300,000 up as a pre-seed fund. So yep. it's not that you have to be very established as a business, it's pre-seed. <laughs> so there's a lot of money up for grabs there and it's very new. So I think, again, with MAP, it's having that connection with other areas of the university that are offering these opportunities. Often people go through MAP and it's been quite a, he's MAP, he's the university. And there, there are, in some level, I think it does need its own identity as well, because it's a different culture. Uh, the university, university has been around for 500 years plus. Um, Melbourne is very old, don't know exactly how old. Um, startup space is quite new, so it's a different culture. But there's also merit in being like, okay, here's a university, MAP's in the university. What other resources and opportunities can be created for, for entrepreneurial students and entrepreneurial staff and alumni? through MAP, through the collaboration with the university and the other offerings. I hope that answered your question. No, did you, that wasn't what I thought too much about, so. No, no, it's great, off. Daisy. Thank you, very interesting. Thanks, Steph, for asking. Thanks, Daisy. Um, we've got a couple of questions. If, if people aren't in a rush to get off, we'll just maybe try and get to these very quickly before we, we wrap up. Um, I've got one in my chat. Um, it says, many new entrepreneurs struggle in sales and marketing sector while starting a new business what what are your key suggestions to improve in these areas what kind of activities do MAC do to improve sales of new businesses i said at the beginning what what what's my kind of advice what MAC provides um, she says what uh, sorry it says what what are your key suggestions okay so, sales and marketing first is that that's some of the hardest stuff in, in, in the startup space, people think hey i'll this has been said a time and time again but i'll say because i'll build a product and people will come and so you're sitting there looking for an idea, like what's my idea? What's my award? Like what can I do? But it's best just to start with, even before you start with marketing, to start with listening to people's problems, listening to how they articulate those problems, like whether it's just, oh, it's so hard to find the price of fuel. I want to go to the best, you know, petrol station to get the cheapest fuel. And there's an app for that now, right? Um, so it's just first is listening to what people are the problems that they're facing. Because to be a good marketer, you really have to understand the psychology of people. You really have to understand why it is that they have that problem and what is the deeper problem there that you want to solve through your the solution you've come up with. Even before you come up with a solution, you might do a lot of these customer interviews around a particular problem that you want to solve and that might spur your imagination. And then I guess when it comes to, mar again, marketing and sales are a bit different. When it comes to marketing, I think 
it's understanding how, again, with the language as well, if it's written market, like copy and things like that, understanding how your customers talk, how, what, what's actually suitable for that industry and the different, I guess, um, platforms. I'll keep it brief because I know we have one more, but I know Sarah on the team and uh, is, you know, runs all the marketing for Met, so she'd be someone really great to also touch on this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that's a that's a great question actually for um, one of our events that we're doing next week. Um, so we we're running a masterclass on PR and marketing for startups. Uh, so that's actually in person at Melbourne Connect on Wednesday the seventh of September, twelve thirty till one thirty. And mm -hmm. I was already planning on on sharing the details with that uh, with everybody on the call afterwards. So yeah, definitely yeah. would recommend coming to that one. Yeah, and those the workshops and that runs are really practical. So it's not necessarily as like academic and marketing analysis or anything. It's, it's the it's really really practical. And you have speakers and who are really in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we've just we'll quickly just get to Sunny's question and then and then we'll wrap up. So yeah, if you want to ask yours now, Sunny, thanks. Hi, Daisy and Sunny. Um, I'm very interested in your um, involvement in the community, especially the Asian community and how you have been uh, working closely with the multicultural communities to build entrepreneurship and encourage financial independence and career development from multicultural people and maybe migrants as well. Yeah. Um is in your questions that how how I've gotten involved in that space how 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 you like what are the key focus uh, when you work with them how do you support them in achieving their career success and entrepreneurship yeah that's interesting so I guess for me there's just been there's been a number of things I guess when I was in my previous accelerator role starting with my day job as well I was always pushing for more migrant women more people like I'd, I remember the first year I looked at the cohort it was predominantly like Anglo-Saxon men and then our whole team like me and my staff we were all like women of color and I thought how what can I do more to make sure this to begin with more applicants from diverse folks right you can't have you can't have a 50 50 representation of the in the accelerator when there's not the applicants aren't even there right so it's like okay what can I do to encourage more applicants so I would be very very accessible open office hours you know I would go through MailChimp and see which is our email thing this is just a small thing I did I go to this extent and be like who's clicked the link that has thought of a point that hasn't applied there might be someone I can follow up with and be like hey I, I saw that you thought about it you should definitely go for it because sometimes people just especially women of color migrant women who aren't in these spaces and don't feel like they belong uh, just need a bit more encouragement so I think that was for my day job and then again after that I launched the digital job accelerator which is very specific to that community and it's with the way that we teach it is very uh taking into consideration like how, how the culture is. So one of the whole modules we talk about is like hierarchy and how kind of we're taught to have a very specific understanding of hierarchy and seniority in that. And that's not always the case when it comes to entrepreneurship. It's very, very different. You just got to go out there and speak to your customer like you speak to your boss, like you speak to everyone. And so that's something we add that kind of cultural sensitivity and cultural understanding to the stuff we teach. Um, and through ASAC, it's just been a lot of advocacy and amplifying voices and, li and listening to the community and see what they want um and then you know amplifying like we have these awards called Australia's Stellar South Asian Women Award which is happening now with an event for it soon uh, I think it's around 22nd September but we organized these awards last year to amplify the voices of South Asian women who are doing really interesting work and one of the awardees this year was um Anjali Sharma when she was 16 she took the federal environment minister to court over climate change <laughs> so we've got some really interesting people so part of my work in this community is finding them and amplifying their voices because they're there um and, and 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 their voices rarely get amplified right so it's like let's find them let's dig deeper into the community and give them a platform to lift them up fantastic thank you we'll love to hear more about it in the future too nice. feel free to connect on linkedin and whatnot like abby said she'll share share the links so just mention you came to this because Sometimes people don't send a message, I don't see it. It falls through. LinkedIn does something funny. Will do. Thank you, Daisy. No worries. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sonny. Okay, um, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, apologies that we've gone a few minutes over time. Uh, so thank you so much for coming today. A huge thank you to Daisy. We've all loved learning more about you and your background. It's been fantastic. Uh, if you are keen to come to our next fireside chat, which is happening on Wednesday, the 21st of September, MEX Marketing and Communications Coordinator Abby Ward will be interviewing Byron McCaughey, who is the new Tram Air Programme Manager. So I'll share
share the details for that via email along with the recording of today's session. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch, please do sign up to our newsletters via the Map and Tram websites and follow us on our social media channels. I'll share the links to these via email later today, along with all of the ways that you can um, follow and get in touch with Daisy. All right. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Abby. Thanks.